Simon Dixon here again for another tweet on the future of finance. So uh, as the Facebook hearings continue, I gave a video yesterday summarizing uh, 10 of the key takeaways. So if you want to catch up on that, please do check out my live stream yesterday on Twitter or I uploaded it to my YouTube channel. Head over to Simon Dixon, do a quick search for Simon Dixon in YouTube and uh, you can check out some of the tweets, uh, the live streams that I've been doing over there. Uh, this t Today I wanted to discuss really a topic that kind of puts together a lot of the stuff I've been talking about. So one of my other videos was discussing the concept of how governments and banks and central banks are going to react um, to some of the systemic risk events in the financial system that I believe are about to unfold in the next global financial crisis. Um, and I believe that uh, central banks are going to start competing with retail banks by issuing their own digital currencies in order to prevent a bailout or bail-in. Just a quick summary, a really quick summary. A bail-in is where uh, what happened in Cyprus during the last financial crisis where banks take um, depositors' funds, normally their higher net worth clients, um, and use it to recapitalize the bank and just take their funds. And the reason they can do that is because when you deposit your money at a bank, the bank becomes the legal owner of that money um, and they can spend it as they choose and stop you spending it as you would like to spend it um, if they choose. Um, and the reason they're in an environment to do that is because they operate off something called a fractional reserve banking system, which means that they can create more uh, deposits than actually exist at their bank. Um, and therefore, the way in which they lend their money and the credit risk that they take to put, determines the solvency of their bank, subject to certain regulations and rules depending on that country. And so what I'm going to do is take a quick trip around the world, because if this thesis is true, um, I'm going to go through the different policies that I think the different countries will take. Um, and uh, I can't go through every country, but I'll go through a few of them. The second thing that the government uh, did during the last financial crisis, they did, they did about four things. They lowered interest rates in order to stimulate borrowing, but when they reached the point of negative interest rates, they lost that tool. Um, they, some countries went for a bail-in policy, other countries went for a bail-out policy. So in the case of the UK, the government just essentially bought the entire banking system and became shareholders in all the banks. And we moved to a more China-based system where the banks were public um, companies uh, and not public companies as in IPOs, but companies run or, op or owned majority shareholders being the government. And so the UK switched its system more like a, a China-based system where the government uh, are the owners of all the banks. Um, and so they used the bailout uh, for that. And then what they did is they uh, ran out a bailout money because uh, they reached what the equivalent of debt ceilings, uh, a reasonable amount of debt that the government can take on. So they had to find a new tool, uh, which was quantitative easing. And quantitative easing was essentially... Um, you know, uh, increasing the amount of money created at a central bank through debt instruments and then lending it to large corporations and banks um, as, so that they could increase the money supply and essentially it ended in the largest redistribution of wealth of cheap interest loans to uh, large companies that I think used a lot of that in order to buy back their stock and stimulate a stock market bubble, which put us into all-time highs. Um, and so none of the problems have actually been solved. Remember, the problem, the cause of the financial crisis was there was too much debt in the system. So they solved that by increasing the debt level to unparalleled, um, you know, choices, unparalleled amounts um, to the point right now where uh, the US said that it will run out of money if it does not increase its debt ceiling beyond, I think it's about 23 trillion, who cares, a trillion here and there, seems ne neither important anymore. Um, but uh, to the point where the US has said they run out of money if they don't increase the debt ceiling. Um, so the, the theory is, is that during the next financial crisis, they won't use interest rates, they won't use quantitative easing, they won't use a bail-in, and they won't use a bail-out. So what are they going to use? Well, I believe that the central bank is going to create its own digital currency that allows the bank to go bust. 
So the the companies like uh, you know some of the most over leveraged banks. Uh, when they realize there's a systemic risk event, we're not sure exactly what the systemic risk event is going to be. It could be a credit card crisis. It could be a student loan crisis. It could be a government debt crisis. It could be a downgrade of uh, the the credit rating of a country's debt. Um, it could be many, many factors, or it could be what happened last time, a tiny little country like Iceland, um, where the investment banks has essentially taken it over with irresponsible banking um, could hit a debt crisis or it maybe it's Italy or maybe it's Greece or who knows we don't it doesn't really matter what the systemic risk event is it's just an event that lets the world know that uh, the financial system needs to react because it's inherently unstable now what's really interesting is all of the agencies that are analyzing cryptocurrencies right now are analyzing cryptocurrencies from a perspective of financial instability um, and the effect it will have on financial instability. Um, the, f the irony that I believe that they don't know is coming is that a lot of these central banks are going to use a digital currency or cryptocurrency, whatever you want to call it, in order to bail out their banking system. So JP Morgan goes bust, you've got $10,000 with Chase Bank, um, and uh, you go to the central bank, the central bank says, uh, if you can prove that you are that customer that JP Morgan or Chase Bank had a deposit with, uh, then download this app and we will issue the equivalent digital currency. Um, and then you can use that and we'll replace your deposit and we'll let Chase Bank go bust. And then essentially the, re the central bank becomes the issuer of money rather than outsourcing it through debt. And essentially we're replacing debt with equity. So cryptocurrencies are based upon um, equity, they're not backed by debt. Um, and so essentially you're deleveraging the economy by replacing all of the bank created uh, debt with central bank uh, reserves or money that they printed out of thin air, um, which they obviously have the authority to do. Um, and it doesn't create hyperinflation because you're just replacing one form of money that already exists and replacing it with another form of money. And so I believe every country or a lot of countries around the world are going to go through some kind of iteration of that process um, as the next financial crisis unfolds. So the question is, um, which country is going to be equipped to do that and who's preparing for that right now? Well, let's have, have a take a, a quick look around the world at some of the countries and some of their cryptocurrency policies um, and how they're going to react to that and also how that relates to some of the large tech companies. Uh, for example, obviously Facebook is uh, in their uh, house hearing today um, and uh, the outcome of that is uh, really, you know, going to determine uh, some of the, the what will happen in the US and other countries as well. So um, how have countries reacted to cryptocurrency? Um, well, let's take a look at some of them. So firstly, let's take a, 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 an economy like the US. So the US obviously has the, the most to lose because it's the world's most important currency at the moment. Gold is priced in dollars, uh, oil is priced in dollars. They negotiated after Bretton Woods, after the World War, uh, that uh, they would become the most important currency in the world. Um, and they use that fact in order to uh, leverage uh, Wall Street to create one of the most liquid stock markets in the world um, and Silicon Valley to create one of the most liquid environments for startups to become globally scalable companies. Um, and because the US dollar is such a powerful country and because it's pr used to price uh, oil and gold, Therefore, they can take um, excessive financial engineering with their currency more than any other country in the world. And so therefore, the US is in probably the worst position uh, because it uh, has the existing um, most important currency. So it's got the least desire to innovate. Uh, but also because it was such an important currency in the world and Donald Trump believes that it will never change uh, and then they will be a dominant currency forever and nothing will ever change, even though history shows that it changes every 50 years. Um, <clears throat> they uh, will have the most aggressive debt policy. So the US currently runs about 24 trillion of debt into their uh, fiat based Ponzi scheme. Um, and uh, they need to increase the debt ceiling right now or they run out of money in September. 
So uh, the Federal Reserve is been, has been looking at their own Fed coin, cryptocurrency, digital currency, whatever you want to call it, for a long time. Um, but I think they're going to be the last to innovate there. Uh, obviously, they have the most to lose, so the you know the, the the failing of the system will affect them the most, and so they should be looking at this most aggressively. The challenge in the U.S. is that because um, the government is so uh, in, uh, over indebted and over leveraged, um, it uh, there's a power play amongst all of the different regulators and institutions around who gets the money. So uh, the SEC wants the wants cryptocurrency to be a security so that they can regulate the industry and find people in order to keep their large buildings alive. Um, they're the securities regulator. Uh, the CFTC um, wants it to be a commodity so that they can keep their large buildings alive. The IRS wants it to be a, uh, a property and money so that if they can change it from property uh, rather than having it as money, they can change it to property because most currency transactions are tax exempt. Um, but property capital gains is a huge uh, money spinner. And because there's been so many capital gains in the cryptocurrency industry, uh, they obviously want to collect all that tax to uh, try and prop up their insolvent uh, debt crisis. Um, and so, but at the same time, the Federal Reserve is also a disjointed system because it consists of like, you know, it's a disjointed regulated environment. You have 50 different states or 52, whatever it is, um, that are all in a power play to try and gain their piece um, of the regulatory pie. Um, and then you have a uh, different state. Uh, the Federal Reserve is broken into different state versions of the Federal Reserve. And so there's a lot of people to argue and, uh, you know, and, and try and get their piece of the pie. And so those arguments might lead to slow action, disjointed. Um, and I personally believe that my personal speculative theory, I could be completely wrong, I could be an idiot, I'm not a politician, I'm just a finance guy that likes to predict and speculate on different trends in technology um, and politics. But uh, the, um, I believe that Donald Trump was uh, set up to be president as the front man for the fall of the US dollar so everyone can actually blame it on Trump. Um, when really it's got nothing to do with Trump. It's just a, a multi-decade Ponzi scheme that's been operating out of the states based upon uh, outsourcing uh, the government. Well, it actually started in the UK in 1694 when the Bank of England decided to outsource. Uh, the, the Bank of England became the banker to the kings and the kings needed to uh, borrow money. Um, I think it was uh, King William or something like that. Um, needed to borrow money in order to fund a war. Um, and uh, therefore, um, over time, uh, the gold backing was removed, etc., etc., until eventually we realized that uh, there was not enough money to cover everything that was at a bank. So um, regulators made it legal for banks to create more money than the deposit actually exists in order to prevent bank runs. And uh, fiat uh, money became a multi-century, uh, decade Ponzi scheme um, and the world's largest regulated Ponzi scheme we've ever seen in history. So uh, the US will probably be the last to do that. Now, if I were a smaller country, so let's look at let's look at some others. Um, obviously, let's let's look at some of the superpower economies. So you've got China. Uh, China have been through a process. So obviously, China comes from uh, a communist background where the government essentially owned all enterprise. Um, they use a interesting system whereby they operate politically off a communist policy but they use pockets of special economic regions in order to uh, benefit from different uh, ways of organizing the economy. So, for example, um, I lived in Hong Kong, and the reason I moved to Hong Kong uh, was because uh, I was, before that, I was in the UK, and I believe that the UK was perpetuating an insane level of debt uh, we'll go into UK in a second, but a completely over leveraged banking system where even the in a fractional reserve banking system, there was no reserve and there was no fraction. Uh, we'll go through that in shortly when we do the UK. But Hong Kong actually operates off a surplus. It brings in more money uh, than it actually spends. And the reason for that is because it benefits from China's uh, budget. Um, but I decided to move to countries that weren't running excessive debt Ponzi schemes. 
Um, they also are open about uh, the fact that banks create money. So if you go to Hong Kong and you get a, uh, an, a Hong Kong dollar note, um, it actually is printed on the front of the Hong Kong dollar note that this was created by HSBC. Um, and they have a, a process of taking turns over which um, banks are actually going to be able to print the money um, for the paper money. Um, but the the point is, is that the, the government is operating off a, off a, a, a not operating from a, a place of insolvency um, or over leverage. <clears throat> Um, anyway, so China uses Hong Kong to trial out capitalism. So Hong Kong is one of the most uh, economically free places I've ever lived. Obviously, it's going through a complete transition right now. Um, and people are wondering what degree of independence it has. Um, but it uses uh, little regions like um, Hong Kong in order to try out capitalism. It then allows a, a region like Macau to um, have a different economic thought and make gambling legal so that uh, they can capture the, the gambling market through Macau. And then Taiwan and different uh, regions that they have different relationships with throughout uh, mainland China. Um, but China obviously uh, created one of the greatest economic growth stories by, um, and many people in China, if you speak to people from the older generation, uh, they, there are a lot of people that still like communism because they came from a place of being a very poverty struck, struck, um, and they rise to the middle class. So a lot of the older people, um, appreciate the government policy. Um, because the government essentially ran all enterprise um, and ran a hybrid model, but also uh, pushed a, a global exporting model that allowed uh, ginormous companies to operate as long as they were in cahoots with the government. Um, and so you had the rise of tech companies like Tencent and Alibaba as they experimented more and more. Um, but they also allowed the tech companies to become banks. Um, so uh, while the government of China is operating all of the banks out there, and they're essentially public banks, uh, they also allowed certain companies like uh, WeChat to uh, disrupt cash in China so that everyone ended up paying their taxis and paying peer-to-peer -peer, um, using apps like WeChat. Um, and Alipay with Alibaba and certain other country uh, companies that they allowed to penetrate into the banking system. Something that uh, the US is going to have to decide what they're going to do on that as Google and Facebook and everybody get into banking. Um, now, China did something really interesting with cryptocurrencies. Uh, firstly, China was one of the very first largest um, economies for speculating on cryptocurrencies. Many of the major exchanges came from China. Um, and uh, in China, a lot of people were, you know, using cryptocurrencies and speculating on cryptocurrencies. Um, so the government during the last uh, ICO boom, which created a ginormous environment of, of fraudsters scamming people using cryptocurrencies in 2017, um, the government decided that they needed to uh, cool down the speculative environment and ban uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. Now, the interesting thing is China was the largest um, economy for mining bitcoins. And many of the mining, you know, many of the complaints at the time was that uh, Bitcoin was becoming too dependent upon China as an economy uh, for its mining operations. And the, the miners in China were becoming larger and larger and larger and having an impact on the decentralized nature of uh, Bitcoin. And so that was a big complaint uh, in the crypto market you know, prior to uh, the, the, the large scaling debate. And that was one of the primary concerns. Um, now, the interesting thing is that China allowed for the, the mining industry to continue. And so essentially, it's a really strange policy because they banned exchanges, but allowed mining to persist. Uh, for those of you not too familiar, mining is the process of verifying all transactions um, and you receive newly created Bitcoins as a reward. And it's what allows us to um, verify every transaction and have the world's largest supercomputer that is larger than any bank in the world um, and any Internet company in the world, um, which verifies every transaction and creates one version of the truth so that you don't need a central bank or a bank in order to actually have uh, the ability for people to send uh, money that they own to other people in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion uh, without needing a, a ledger or a central bank or anything to trust. Um, and the interesting thing is that mining is the process of taking fiat currency and buying equipment and machinery like the renminbi or the, the Chinese yuan 
Um, and uh, when you buy that equipment, you get Bitcoins out. And there's no KYC or know your customer or anti-money laundering processes in that because essentially you're taking uh, the, 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 cover, the currency created by the government, buying machinery, you're not circumventing capital controls because you're not actually sending money out of the economy, but you get Bitcoin out um, and uh, therefore those Bitcoin can circulate in the economy and you can do with as you choose. Um, so essentially that means that they allowed the industry that gives them no data to persist but they banned the industry that would give them all the data they want, which is the exchange, because the exchanges you can regulate. You can tell them to do you know your customer policies and anti-money laundering policies uh, because they are the on-ramp and off-ramp between traditional fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies. And so really regulating your cryptocurrency exchanges is the key to trying to get as much data, which is what the governments obviously want at the end of the day, so that they can charge tax, so that when they can charge tax, they can um, try and pay down some of their uh, ponds scheme but obviously that's a bit of a lie as well because uh, if they did pay down too much of their ponzi scheme then that would create a systemic risk because all debt is money and you have to have new debt in order to uh, prevail in order for the economy to grow so it's a bit of a lie that they're trying to pay it off but anyway they, they like to keep that illusion going um and so that's uh you know so so china is in an interesting situation at the government level they were the first one of the first to announce that they're creating their own uh, digital currency um, using this technology. So I think they're completely prepared uh, for if they need to do that. Uh, they're in a slightly different situation because the government is such, you know, it's not it's not a full capitalist economy. Um, and uh, therefore, they're in a slightly different situation in terms of the tools that the government could use uh, to protect when they get over leveraged. Um, so, uh, there's that situation. So I think they're completely prepped with their own digital currency to bail out the system. Uh, they have more of a savings based economy than a debt based economy. However, they have been following the Western model and the debts, uh, rights that rates have been raising as they've transitioned more from communism to capitalism. Um, and they have their, their pockets of capitalism through, uh, economies like Hong Kong. Um, Let's look at some other countries. So UK, for example, uh, UK has one of the most over leveraged banking system in the world. Uh, the government needed to buy up all the banks during the last financial crisis and become the largest shareholders in the four to five clearing banks like HSBC, Lloyds, uh, Barclays, uh, Santander, which is a Spanish bank that ended up um, through lots of mergers and acquisitions changing. Um, and uh, various other things. So the government is a large holder of the shares and the stock of the banking system. I think they've deleveraged those positions over time um, as it looked as they created an illusion of the economy growing as stock markets hit all new time highs. And QE um, injected new money into the banking system and uh, the large corporations creating a stock market bubble to push up the prices. And also they have crazy policies around um, allowing anyone to own their own homes by uh, essentially subprime loans is really prevalent in the UK. Uh, the government will lend you the money in order to uh, get the deposit if you can't afford it. Um, and they've still got a, a very subprime uh, mortgage type industry within the UK with the government propping up the property market so that it um, prevents uh, the, a bank run essentially and the issues that can, can come from banking that happened in uh, 2007, 8, 9 um, last time. Um, but they also have um, very little stress testing on the banks. Um, the You can loophole, as with the US, you can loophole some of the stress tests by um, the, 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 well, the, there's been different policies to separate the independence between retail and investment banking. Um, but you can still over, if you haven't got enough reserves, then you can back it up with debt, um, government debt. And that government debt was created through rehypothecation. Uh, so it was a debt instrument in the first place. So you can back your bank by a debt instrument. So rather than having a reserve, you can use a debt instrument. Um, and also um, there, uh, you can use investment banking um, by partnering with a retail bank in order to over leverage, as we saw during the subprime crisis, where essentially a retail bank had a requirement on how much reserves it needs to have. But what it didn't have um, is it, it could repackage those, uh, those debt products 
uh, give it to the investment bank to create a product that they could sell to your pension. Um, and then your pension fund manager would take the exposure and therefore you could leverage up the mortgage markets many times over, which was what caused the subprime crisis last time. Um, and so the UK has uh, crazy debts as well, over two trillion um, for, a, you know, for an economy the size of the UK. Um, and the Bank of England has its own digital currency innovation department. I'm sure they've created their own uh, digital currency um, as a fail safe for when their banking system over leverages and collapses. Um, but so I'm sure they're prepared for that. And I think the Bank of England would be very likely to uh, do that uh, because they were the last most important currency in the world. Um, and I think that they would like to have a power play um, even though they got relations with the US dollar, I think they'd see a power play in GBP if they could react first uh, during the next systemic risk event, uh, then the Bank of England might fancy that. Um, I do actually believe one of the high contenders to be a winner is actually Japan. Uh, so Japan has a crazy welfare system, over leveraged, debt insane through the roof, um, but uh, they were also one of the most um, proactive in attracting much of the digital currency business. So they were the first to create um, a working regulated environment for cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, and they were the one of the first to embrace Bitcoin um, as almost like many of the properties of a median of exchange. And when I go visit Japan, you can walk down the streets in Tokyo and you can see billboards with Bitcoin accepted here. You can go into a shop and you can use uh, Bitcoin as a medium of exchange in many of the large electric shop, uh, electronic shops. Um, their equivalent of Google um, and Amazon is getting ready to launch integration with uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, and they were one of the first to uh, try and create a digital, uh, I think it's called a J coin or something like that. But um, and their banks are actually, um, you know, some of the, the largest banks um, are actually deep into the cryptocurrency space. Uh, so uh, some of the largest banks like SBI have been mining Bitcoin since I think 2011 or something really early 2012, 13, maybe. Um, and so I think that uh, the Japanese yen is ripe to be digitized um, and uh, the government would, the central bank would be one of the first to do it. They've got the regulated environment. They've attracted a lot of the industry. They have the debt crisis with their own currency. Um, and so I think uh, Japan is actually one of the economies uh, that would be ripe to uh, position themselves if anything really bad would, were to happen with the US dollar. Um, and that would be one of my best picks at the, the next world superpower. Um, the other thoughts uh, that you could look at, um, obviously, uh, South Korea is really big in cryptocurrency, but they, the regulators have been, uh, you know, slow to move. Um, and, uh, but I think the other ones to, to, to not miss is the underdogs, the small economies and how they react to this. So uh, when I was speaking with a lot of uh, smaller countries, um, I was invited to speak at the first ever uh, cryptocurrency uh, currency conference operated by a government which was to support Bitcoin, which was in Isle of Man uh, when they launched the Crypto Valley Conference. Um, oh, you've also got Switzerland, which is worth talking about as well. <coughs> um, but uh, the, the, the countries, the small countries, um, now what I would be recommending if they were following my deluded, crazy uh, tin hat advice, uh, tin foil hat advice, is I would be recommending them to allocate a portion of their electricity to mining Bitcoin um, and see it as an investment um, and speculate on whether Bitcoin becomes a world reserve, uh, a, 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 one of the assets included in a basket of world reserve assets like gold and the dollar and uh, treasuries and all that that central banks use in order to hold their reserves. Um, and so I would, these smaller countries that have got, you know, they're, they're, they're operating stable economies. So one of the reasons I uh, moved to the Isle of Man is because it's actually illegal for the government to take on debt. So they have to balance their books. You'll notice that uh, I've always picked countries based upon uh, the government's policies on debt uh, where to surface. 
um, and uh, it's illegal for the government to take on debt by mandate, by law. Um, and so they have to make their books balance and make the, the small island operate. Um, but I w I've been recommending uh, smaller islands to speculate some of their energy power into mining Bitcoin um, and accumulate a Bitcoin pile and hold it on reserve. Um, because if Bitcoin, um, you know, fails, then OK, use a, a manageable amount of your budget and electricity and power to do that. Um, but if it succeeds in the way that I think it will succeed, um, based upon all the economic trends and the fact that Bitcoin's now becoming our world's best shot at achieving sound money, then my speculation is that the price of Bitcoin will be significantly higher um, and you could find yourself where your Bitcoin reserves are worth more uh, than your entire debt, your entire economy, in fact. Um, and it could be uh, one of the world's largest shifts in terms of your country's influence in the future if you're taking a five to ten year. Um, you know, if you understand the economics of Bitcoin, um, you're only speculating what you can afford to lose. Um, and uh, you're taking you're participating in what might be one of the world's largest shifts in power um, based upon monetary power and financial spending ability. And so that's what I'd be recommending. The smaller central banks, I think, would be the first to hold. And in fact, I think many of them are doing it now, but not announcing it. Um, using Bitcoin as a diversification as one of their assets that they hold at the central bank level. And I think that when there's uh, some issues with the dollar, someone who is one of these central banks that has been accumulating vast quantities of Bitcoin is going to be in a position whereby they can make a public announcement about their Bitcoin holding as a world, as you know, their speculation on it becoming a world reserve uh, currency. Um, and then that could dramatically push the interest in Bitcoin and therefore the value of their holding um, becomes, you know, significantly greater than other central banks. Um, and therefore they can really uh, be the, the first in a game of chicken, in a game of game theory where the central banks have to scramble in order to accumulate the fixed supply of Bitcoin in order to be on the right side of the curve. Um, and uh, this is how you could end up in the most, uh, you know, one of the likely scenarios that, that, that central banks in a game theoretical situation, their uh, wealth is determined by how many Bitcoin that they actually hold in a, in a, in a, in a game of chicken, um, where the smallest ones start first and the US obviously goes moves last because they got the most to lose. And you can kind of go up the, the theory and then you, you, you start to think about, well, which central banks will react first to that? Uh, well, they'll obviously create their own cryptocurrencies in order to bail out their banking system um, and then rely upon financial technology companies. So you've got to look at three factors here. One is their ability to create their own cryptocurrency, uh, how fast they can move in order to bail out a banking system. So you need a, con a country that's already prepared for that. Um, the ones that are going to do that first will be the ones that are operating off the largest, most amount of debt, most over leveraged. Um, the second thing you've got to look at is whether their central bank was forward thinking enough in order to accumulate Bitcoin in one of these scenarios. Um, so therefore, the government has a vested interest or the central bank has a vested interest in the success of Bitcoin. And I think the smaller central banks will be the ones to do that first. And then because the central bank doesn't want to be in the business of retail banking, uh, they'd need a very robust regulatory environment for financial technology companies to prosper. And so really, these three forces, I believe, are going to determine who becomes the next uh, superpower in a falling um, in, a, in an environment where the USD uh, becomes less important in the world. To recap those three things, their ability to launch a digital currency to bail out their banking system based upon their fiat currency, their ability to have a robust environment for financial technology companies to build upon their, uh, their, their uh, digital currency built at the central bank. Um, and thirdly, the central bank or the governments um, are forward thinking enough in order to uh, allocate some of their energy towards mining or their ability to accumulate Bitcoin and then announce it as a, an asset that they're using as part of their reserves. And I think a country that, that lines up those three things, 
is the country that could be perfectly positioned to actually uh, become the next superpower of the world. And let's not let's face this. This is all about uh, country currency wars in order to be the next superpower of the world. Which countries are positioned to do that? Switzerland's a contender. Japan's a contender. Um, and, uh, you know, there's uh, I th uh, there's uh, some of the other things that we talked about today. Um, I'd love to go into more countries, but I, I think this video is already much longer than it needs to be. I tried to keep these to 10 minutes. I failed every single live stream that I've done because I think that this is just a fascinating time in financial history. Um, we're seeing one of the biggest uh, shifts in financial history and really one of the most exciting times to be alive. Um, you, as an individual, need to decide uh, how you're going to position yourself um, amongst that. And one thing to leave you on is that while this might be, uh, you know, really something you really don't want to think about, you have to recognize that we live in a world of speculation. Uh, every decision that you make is a speculation. If you decide to allocate your money and hold it in savings in fiat, you are speculating on the credit rating of the bank that you're holding it in. If you decide that you want to reallocate your money to real estate or property, then you are speculating on the credit risk of the banking system um, and the government's policies of how they prop up the prices of property. If you decide that you're relying upon your pension, then you are speculating on the solvency of that system within your country or the system that you're, you're relying upon. If you decide to hold your money in dollars versus the pounds, then you're speculating on the, that country's... Um, if you decide that you are taking a position in Bitcoin, then you're speculating on the uncertainty of uh, certain events happening and the fact that people owning their own money, uh, spending their own money and having a monetary policy that cannot be as independent of politics and tends to reward the saver because of its fixed money supply is going to be important in the future of the world. If you decide to hold your money in cash, you're making a bet on whether the government will actually allow cash to be legal in the future. Um, and so what I will just want to leave with you is that you have a choice. Your choice is you either have somebody else do your speculation for you and be the mercy of the system, or you decide to educate yourself, think outside the box um, and make your own speculations based upon what you think is going to happen next. But have it be known that whatever decision you make, either somebody else is speculating for you and you're leaving that decision to them, or you're going to speculate yourself and you're going to make some decisions about how you allocate your, 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 your assets and what you do as these situations unfold. Unfortunately, uh, we can no longer ignore these situations. Um, the, the situation has been rehypothecated and kicked down the, the, the can. The can's been kicked down the road for, for too long now. Um, and everybody needs to make their decisions. What's the timing on these? I have no idea on the timing. I just believe personally that these things are inevitable, predictable, guaranteed at some point. It may not play out the way that I talk about. It may not play out um, in exact sequence of events. This video could be used as the archives to make me look like a complete idiot. I don't care. Um, I'm just enjoying. And, uh, and if people can make better financial decisions based upon um, learning a bit more about the system um, and making their own speculations rather than relying on other people to make their speculations, um, then I will keep recording. Uh, if you like this video, please retweet, please share, please like, please comment. Go to my YouTube channel, Simon Dixon. I will give commentary as this whole thing unfolds. Uh, the different event in the most exciting time in financial history. Uh, go to my YouTube, look up Simon Dixon, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. Um, and that will notify you every time I go live. Thank you for your time. I'm going to get back to work building a future of finance.